In 1981, a 13-year-old girl named Mary Louise Day went missing from her family home in California. She seemed to have disappeared into thin air, and most of the people involved in the case, including some of her family, believed that she may have been killed by her parents. But then, over 20 years later, someone who looked a lot like Mary and had a valid ID in her name suddenly turned up, taking this case in a completely unexpected turn. In this video, I'll be discussing the disappearance of Mary Day and the woman who may have been this missing girl. Let's start at the beginning. Mary Day was born on February 19, 1968 in Little Falls, New York. She was the oldest daughter of three born to parents Charles Day and Charlotte Pressler. She and her sisters Kathy and Sherry had a tumultuous childhood. It's been reported that the household was dysfunctional and their mother couldn't properly care for the girls. As a result, they spent a great deal of their early years bouncing in and out of foster care. Eventually, their mother ended up getting a divorce from their father and remarried a man named William Hewell shortly afterwards. In 1975, stepfather William enlisted in the army, and Charlotte ended up regaining full and permanent custody of two of her kids, Mary and Kathy. The third sister, Sherry, was adopted by her foster family. In 1978, when Mary would have been 10 years old, William was stationed in Hawaii and the family moved to live on the base there. Charlotte and William also had two more kids around this time a son named William Jr. and a daughter named Billie Jean. Soon after this, Mary and Kathy's father Charles passed away. He ended up leaving them an inheritance, which Kathy said that they would refer to as an escape plan and talk about using the code word Mohawk to keep it a secret. In 1980, while still living in Hawaii, Mary had to be removed from the home due to physical abuse from her stepfather William and placed into protective custody. When William's base was changed to Fort Ord in Seaside, California, the family again moved, but Mary remained in care in Hawaii for several more months. Eventually, she was returned to the care of her mother and stepfather and sent to live in California, but this proved to be very difficult for Mary. She would try to run away from home frequently, but she would always end up being returned by police officers. She was never enrolled in school while living in Seaside, California. While the family was somewhat transient due to William's job in the military, it's very odd that she wouldn't at least be enrolled in any of the local schools while they were living there. Now here's where the story really takes a turn. In 1981, while still living in California, the family went out for dinner but left 13-year-old Mary and 11-year-old Kathy at home alone. When they returned, they found that William's dog, who he said to have loved very dearly, was laying on the kitchen floor. It had become gravely ill. In an interview with police as an adult, Kathy said that William was enraged at the sight. He started to yell at the girls because he thought Mary had poisoned his dog. He cornered Mary to confront and eventually beat her. Kathy would later say that she could hear Mary yelling and crying as her stepfather hit her, and when she saw her sister afterwards, there was blood coming from her mouth. According to Kathy, this was the last night that the family saw Mary. By the next morning, she was gone without a trace. While Mary had run away before and was always returned to the home quickly, this time was different. No officers knocked on their door to bring 13-year-old Mary back to her parents, and no one had heard from or seen the young girl at all since that night. However, despite their daughter being missing, Mary's parents didn't file a police report. Due to the family moving frequently and Mary not being enrolled in school, it's unlikely that people outside of the family knew about her disappearance. And when her sister brought the missing girl up to their parents, their mother said that Mary had run away and not to ask about her ever again. It seemed as if their parents wanted to forget that Mary had ever existed, but her siblings could never forget their older sister. The family relocated to New York a short time later, and it was at this time that Mary and Kathy's sister Sherry, who'd been adopted by her foster family, reconnected with them. Sherry was confused to see that Mary was nowhere to be found, and the feelings got worse when she was hushed and told to stop asking where her sister was. In an interview, Sherry later said, Laying in bed one night with Kathy, I asked her, you know, I was like, what happened with Mary, you know? And she was like, shh, don't say anything. We're not allowed to talk about Mary. Sherry would find herself haunted by the whole situation throughout her childhood and into adulthood. Despite what she was told by her family, she couldn't just ignore the situation, and her suspicions grew. She just couldn't understand how a mother could give up and not try at all to find her missing child. Sherry would go on to discuss the strange comments that her parents made about the situation in an interview, specifically referencing something unnerving that Charlotte said. My mother told me that there were a lot of places in California that you could bury a body and they'd never be found. I started believing she was murdered. Eventually in 1994, Sherry filed a missing persons report 
and this was the first time that Mary had been reported missing in the 13 years since her disappearance. The police didn't even end up receiving the case until eight years later, and the investigation was launched in 2002. An age progression photo was made, showing Mary from around the time of her disappearance and then what she might look like at 31 years old. One of the first steps the investigators took was going to the family home where Mary had last been seen all those years ago. Mary's mom, Charlotte, and her stepdad, William, were no longer living at the home and had moved to Kansas. At the house, detectives met with her sister, Kathy, who showed them around the property. Kathy would point out a corner of the backyard that their stepfather had instructed her and her siblings never to play in. Detectives searched the area with cadaver dogs, who alerted to that corner. After some time digging, they found a shoe that would fit a young girl. Whether or not the shoe belonged to Mary hasn't been publicly confirmed. The detectives were sure that they would find a body, and continued to dig, but no remains were present despite all four cadaver dogs alerting independently to the same spot. The dog handler on the case is said to have believed that a body was moved from the area. Upon speaking to the neighbors, the police learned that they hardly remembered the family who lived at the home, and no one could recall anything about Mary Day's presence or disappearance. Adding on to this was the fact that detectives on the case couldn't find any evidence of Mary running away and starting a new life. No IDs had been issued, no paychecks, no arrests. Any avenue that they checked, there was no sign of Mary. The inheritance checks that she had been receiving from her dad had continued to come in, and interest would build up as they went uncashed. With a great deal of suspicion that the case was not that of a runaway, but rather a murder victim, local detectives set up an interview with Mary's mother Charlotte to talk about her missing daughter. She was still together with William, who had left the army and was now working as a corrections officer. Charlotte's demeanor throughout the interview was rather strange. At one point, she joked with the officers about them having whips and chains. You know, life is full of regrets. If you go back and say, you know, if I had did this and this and this. Oh, yeah. We've all been there. Okay. So, this is my problem. I didn't do a lot of things I should have, and I didn't do a lot of things I could have and would have. Now I'm stuck with consequences. She also seemed extremely indifferent towards finding her daughter. When asked specifically about what she thought happened to Mary, Charlotte would say that she thought the girl had just run away in 1981 and never returned. She would go on to talk about how this happened all the time, saying, Oh, what a mess. It was like trying to get a nightcrawler out of a wormhole and just grabbing it and it was gone, and grabbing it and it was gone. I mean, how many times did she run away? You know, all these questions I can't answer. The officer went on to ask if the parents had made any sort of effort to find Mary, and Charlotte answered that they should have. When pressed further by the police officer about it, she answered that William had said that they filed a police report, but she couldn't remember doing it. One of the most shocking statements that Charlotte made during the interrogation was when she was asked why she hadn't made any effort to find Mary. Charlotte replied to this by simply saying, If she's dead, she's dead. Her nonchalant attitude further added to the suspicions against the couple, and shortly after her interview, William was brought in for questioning by Detective Joe Bertena. He made some similarly bizarre statements about what had happened to Mary. When he was asked about what happened on that last night that anyone had seen Mary in 1981, here's what William had to say. You know what she did? She poisoned my dog. I was really angry. She tried to run out of the house. I didn't want her to go, so I caught her before she got out of the front door. She was kicking me, punching me, so I pushed her. William made a martial arts type of choking or striking gesture with his hand while saying this. When asked to clarify how exactly he struck her, William would go on to say that he hit her in the upper chest but that it may have slipped off and hit her in the throat. His rage was seemingly entirely out of control. The detective asked him to explain how angry he was on that night on a scale of 1 to 10 and William said that it was a 15. The detective would respond that with this level of anger, it seemed possible that William may have killed his stepdaughter. William replied, no, I didn't kill her, but the next day my wife Charlotte told me that that night she saw Satan in my eyes, and she said I was possessed by a demon. Feeling like he was on the verge of confessing, Detective Bertina tried to work with this statement to get an admission of guilt out of William. He said, Okay, William, I believe you. You didn't kill her. But what about that demon inside of you? Could that demon have killed Mary? And if he didn't feel like he was speaking to a killer yet, the next words out of William's mouth convinced him that this man had murdered his stepdaughter. William would say, Yes, the demon could have killed her. I couldn't have killed Mary. My body would have done it, but it wouldn't have been me. It would have been that demonic personality, because I blacked out. 
William would go on to claim that later that night, he went to check on all the children in their bedrooms and found that Mary's was empty. He said that he and Charlotte were shocked and called the police in a panic. Of course, we know that there is no record of that phone call being made. The detective then asked William why they had been so panicked if Mary running away and being returned soon after was so common. He wasn't able to give a proper answer to this question. The interview ended with the detective feeling like he had just let a killer walk free. In a later interview, he would say that he never felt closer to getting a confession out of someone. Detective Joe Bertana and police chief Steve Kirchone were certain that they'd found their man, and while they still didn't have a body, they felt like a solid case was being built and that the DNA would be ready to file soon. But then the case took a sharp turn that no one could have predicted. About a year after homicide detectives began working on Mary Day's case, Steve got a phone call from a colleague telling him that he had big news and he better sit down. The officer on the phone would go on to say that the police in Phoenix, Arizona had pulled over a car for stolen plates and identified the driver as Mary Day, the woman he was convinced had been killed on that night in 1981. Just like that, over 20 years after vanishing without a trace, it seemed like Mary had returned just as suddenly as she had gone missing. In the 2003 routine traffic stop, officers stopped a pickup truck with stolen license plates. They ran the ID of the passengers and were stunned when one woman's ID returned the result that she had been entered into the missing persons database by investigators. Her Arizona issued ID was valid and listed her name as Mary Louise Day. Shortly after this discovery, Detective Bertano went to Arizona to meet with the woman. He took a photo of her during this meeting and sent it to Police Chief Crichone, and both men were initially skeptical, but acknowledged that she did strongly resemble the missing girl. For reference, here's a picture of Mary's age progression photo predicting what she might look like, and the woman that investigators spoke with. Still, the police were quite skeptical. While she had the same name as the missing girl and bore a resemblance to her, one thing that struck the investigators as suspicious was that the ID had been issued only three weeks before the traffic stop, when they were well into building a murder case. And it wasn't just this timing that made them question her identity. When Detective Bertana spoke with the woman identified as Mary Day in person, he asked some very specific questions about what exactly had happened to her the night that she disappeared. Her answer was that she ran away from her mother Charlotte and her stepfather William, and that she had tried to lay low ever since she left. He noted that she sounded very hesitant when she spoke, and the details weren't quite all there. His concerns would escalate after a later phone call with the woman. Here's some of the transcript of that phone call. Do you want to talk about what happened that last night? It hurts. I'm sure it does, but what happened that last night? I'm so confused anymore. I don't know what's real or not. I remember he kept slamming my head into the tub and it hurt. Is that when you started bleeding? I started bleeding and he hit my head on the coffee table. I think I blacked out. Maybe that's why I can't put all the pieces together. The main detail that Joe would find sketchy during this phone call was that she had absolutely no memory of the sick dog, which had been brought up by several of the family members. This, along with the fact that she could offer up only very sparse information about what she had been doing for the past 20 years, felt more and more suspicious to the officers on the case. They really questioned the woman's identity. Instead of referring to her as Mary Day, they would use the name Phoenix Mary when speaking about her. She herself would explain that no one had called her Mary since she was a child, because she had been concealing her identity by going by the name Monica Devereaux. She was scared that if she used her real name, she would be taken back home. This appeared to be a confirmed name or alias for her when detectives found magazines addressed to a Monica Devereaux. Interestingly, this is the same initials as Mary Day. All the skepticism began to frustrate her. In a phone conversation with Detective Bertana, she would ask, If you were to find my body, how are you going to be able to prove who the hell I was? When he replied that they would use DNA testing, she asked if that couldn't be used as proof of who she was because she's alive. Detective Bertana skirted around this, saying that there wasn't any record or proof of her existence up until extremely recently, almost as if she hadn't existed until just before they found her. Agitated, she would reply, So, I'd be better off if I'm just dead and then you all can do that detecting from there. With that, Police Chief Steve Crichone decided it was time to order a DNA test to see if she was really Charlotte's missing daughter. He would say that most of the people involved in the case didn't really think that the DNA would match. But then, as a shock to nearly everyone, it was a match. The woman they'd been calling Phoenix Mary was identified as Charlotte's missing daughter, Mary Day. Her sister Sherry was so excited to find out that the sister who she had long suspected may have met a tragic fate was really alive. 
she leapt at the chance to let Mary move in with her. Although you might think that with the DNA match, suspicions would be eased and the case would be closed, that's not quite true here. After Mary moved into the home, Sherry started to feel like something wasn't quite right. The first strange thing that she noticed was that this Mary spoke with a Midwestern or Southern accent, which the detectives on the case had also noticed and pointed out to Mary. She would get really irritated when this came up and ask if they're still trying to prove who she is. Dialect experts who listened to this Mary speak would say that her accent would take about 9-10 to 10 years of living in the South in her formative years to develop. However, Mary would say that she only lived there briefly as an adult and that was why she spoke in this accent. And it wasn't just the detectives and Sherry who didn't quite believe her. Kathy, Mary Day's other sister, also had her doubts about the identity of the newly found Mary. She would say that she had a gut feeling that this just wasn't her sister. One major concern she had was that this Mary had no memory of any inheritance received from their father passing away, nor did she remember the code word for talking about it, which as I mentioned earlier was Mohawk. And then Joe would get an email from Mary. While he hasn't provided the words that she used verbatim, it was apparently something very similar to, I've been lying to you about who I am. Despite these doubts, after the DNA testing identified Mary, the case remained closed. But that's not where the strangeness ends. A few years later, in 2008, Steve Crichone was sitting in his office when he got a phone call from officers working with cadaver dogs on an unrelated case at the Fort Ord Army Base. They told him that they had the dogs go over hundreds and hundreds of homes on the base, and there had been just one hit, and this just so happened to be on a house that Mary's stepfather, William, along with the rest of the family, had lived in shortly after her disappearance. The area was searched and the police dug up the yard to search for answers, but they came up completely empty-handed. The team who had been working the Mary Day case felt a sense of deja vu when they thought back to searching the backyard of the home that Mary disappeared from, and having the cadaver dogs consistently hit on one area but finding nothing. They began to wonder if it was possible that Mary had been murdered that night and her body was moved between the homes when the family moved, and then hidden somewhere else afterwards. To investigate further, Steve Crichone hired a retired homicide detective named Mark Clark to assist with the case as he felt that the situation with the cadaver dogs may have been more than just a coincidence. Mark had soil samples from the home studied by the Body Farm, an organization that's focused on research surrounding the decomposition of human bodies. The results of their study indicated that the soil was consistent with a human being being buried there. When asked about the case, Mark would say that he's sure that the real Mary Day was killed that night in 1981, and he believes that William essentially admitted to doing it. When asked what this means in terms of the woman who was identified by DNA as being one of Charlotte's daughters, Mark would posit that she's an imposter. His theory on how this can be explained is not entirely improbable. He believes that before Mary was born, Charlotte had had another daughter who she kept a secret and gave up at birth. This daughter would grow up to be the woman that they identified as Mary Day. There is some circumstantial evidence that backs up this theory. Mark stated that Charlotte had been married multiple times and that she may have been involved in affairs that resulted in pregnancies. He believes that Charlotte and William used the secret daughter to their advantage and cooked up an elaborate plot to avoid being charged with murder when they felt like the evidence had become overwhelming. He thinks that the couple had reached out to this other daughter and asked her to take on Mary's identity. They would have been able to give her the real Mary's birth certificate and social security number so that she could secure identification in Mary Day's name and her DNA would be a match, so it would be very difficult to refute it. But what would the secret daughter's motivation be to agree to participate in the scheme? Mark believes he has an answer for this question, too. He explained that the motivation may have been financial. Mary had continued to receive inheritance checks due to never being reported missing, and with all the interest that had built up over a decade, the total amount of money would be about $60,000. When Mary was identified as being Charlotte's daughter, Sherry would help her get her portion of the inheritance. While doubt and skepticism was rampant, police tried to be careful not to try and make a story fit their beliefs or assumptions about what happened. The case was quiet for quite some time, but then in 2017, Sherry felt like she couldn't ignore her feelings anymore and she needed some answers. Mary was no longer living with her, so Sherry, along with the crew of 48 Hours, went to visit her at her home in Missouri. She'd been living there for a few years. Sherry would say that she was really hoping that she would get a confession from Mary and learn her true identity during this visit. Unfortunately, Mary wasn't up to speaking with her. She'd been struggling with the effects of late-stage cancer and couldn't handle any visitors. However, someone else involved in the case was able to get some information out of Mary, and it shone a light in the opposite direction. 
the new chief of the Seaside Police Department, Judy Veloz, was not convinced that Mary had been murdered in 1981 and didn't think that they were dealing with an imposter. She ordered additional DNA tests, and they indicated that Mary's DNA matched both Charlotte and her previous husband, Charles, making the secret daughter theory a lot less plausible. Another big piece of evidence that Chief Judy Veloz would point to was the shoe found in the backyard. Previously, it had been suspected that the shoe may have been Mary's, left behind when her body was moved. However, when she picked it up and held it, it fit right in her palm, making it really small for someone who would have been 13 years old at the time. And then, when Judy Veloz spoke to Mary directly, she uncovered new information about what the decade after running away had looked like for her. Mary would bring up a woman who she said that she had met and stayed with during the years in California immediately following her disappearance. The woman's name was Maury Kimmel. When asked about her time with Mary, Maury would say that she had met Mary when she was almost 15 years old. She would describe Mary as being innocent and childlike and say that her two young daughters really loved her. Mary would stay with them for about a year, despite Maury and her daughters being by all accounts loving and happy to have Mary stay. She would disappear without warning one day, leaving Maury heartbroken. And what about the situation with the ID? It turns out that the circumstances of her finally getting identification were not as suspicious as detectives had once thought. Mary would explain that she had to get her gallbladder removed, and she would need insurance to cover the cost. To get insurance, she would need ID. A local nonprofit organization assisted Mary with acquiring her birth certificate, and she was then able to get her driver's license shortly afterwards, something she'd never been able to do previously. Another consistent suspicion that many people involved had about Mary was her lack of memory of many of the key details of what happened to her and where she'd been. Judy Velaz has an explanation for this as well. She stated that Mary had been struggling with an alcohol addiction since she was a teenager, and this, as well as trauma from the abuse she endured at the hands of her family, were both valid explanations for why someone may experience gaps in their memory or even repressed memories. And that email that Mary sent to Detective Joe Bertano where she alluded to lying about her identity? Judy Velaz says that while this email was sent by Mary, she followed up with another email where she would say that she didn't really know what she was trying to say in the previous email. At the time that these were sent, Mary was actively struggling with severe alcoholism. And then suddenly, Judy Velaz found one more piece of evidence that disproved the theory that Mary had been killed in 1981. One of Maury's friends was able to find a photo of a girl that looked a lot like Mary, taken at least a year after Mary disappeared. Judy Velaz was convinced, and she finalized and submitted her report, officially closing the case of Mary Day. She was certain that the Mary she spoke to was not an imposter after all. When 48 Hours covered the case, they brought the picture to a facial recognition company called Trueface. When they ran the photo through their software, the results would indicate that the probability of this being the same person as in Mary Day's childhood photos was 99%. Soon afterwards, Mary would meet with a journalist from 48 Hours and her sister Sherry. While this interview doesn't seem to have been recorded, Mary was reported to have expressed how frustrated she had felt trying to prove her identity. Sherry left this meeting convinced once and for all that this was her sister. But not everyone is so convinced. Mark Clark admitted that he did second-guess his theory when he saw Judy Veloz's report, but he remained adamant that he still felt like they were dealing with an imposter. For Steve Crichone, he was a bit more in the middle. He felt like the new information uncovered in the report made him a lot more certain that this was the real Mary. But he felt like something was still hidden when he thinks back to the cadaver dog's findings. He would say that he strongly believes that there were in fact grave sites at both homes that William and Charlotte had lived in, and the only question remaining in his mind is who exactly was buried there. Sadly, after battling severe alcoholism for many years and being in the late stages of cancer, Mary would pass away only nine days after being interviewed by Judy Velaz. She would have been 49 years old. No funeral was held for her. So that's the case of Mary Day. While the case is overall completely tragic and heartbreaking, I hope that in the end, Mary at the very least had her frustrations eased when the investigation was finally over and her sister Sherry was certain that she was truly still alive. This was definitely a case where there are a lot of areas that can leave you skeptical, especially before the final report where Mary was able to provide a lot more context and information. I leave this case fully convinced that the Mary Day that the investigators found was the real Mary Day. But what about you? Please leave your comments below with any thoughts about the investigation or the outcome of this case. As always, thanks so much for joining me on another video. There's more to come, and I hope to see you all soon.